It's my pleasure to kick off this online course on international human rights law in Kashmir prospects and challenges with a discussion on right to life. We have with us Dr. Stuart Maslin. Stuart is an honorary professor at the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights, specializing in the use of force and protection of civilians under international law. He holds a doctorate in the law of armed conflict and a master's degree in international human rights law and forensic ballistics. Among other publications, Stuart is the author of the upcoming book, The Right to Life Under International Law, Cambridge University Press. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much, uh, Samir. Thanks to Gayathri and the team uh, for the invitation to talk to you this afternoon. Um, my uh, book will come out in uh, September, um, and uh, that's less of an advertisement and more of a a caution uh, that uh, being five years in the writing, I can bore for Britain on this topic. Uh, that is not my aim this afternoon. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the next uh, 30 or so minutes is uh, give you an overview of where I think the right to life stands uh, under international law and what some of the either emerging trends or controversies are. Um, and of course, with a, a particular focus towards the end, on uh, the situation in uh, India. Um, there will be, of course, a long opportunity for you to put questions or uh, comments to me. Uh, so with that uh, said, I will dive uh, straight in uh, and give a quick uh, overview of Indian adherence to human rights treaties. Um, in some respects, uh, India is a party to the uh, key agreements uh, surprising omissions, as you can see uh, from the slide, is that India is a long-standing signatory to the Convention Against Torture and the Convention on Enforced Disappearance. Uh, this is, of course, uh, disappointing. But uh, the right to life is set out uh, in uh, three of the treaties that you can see highlighted uh, above. Primary amongst them, of course, is the 66 Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it's to that uh, that I will direct uh, the bulk of my uh, remarks. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, as you know, uh, also in its Article 6 talks about uh, the right to life and the duty to ensure to the maximum extent survival and development. And India, in fact, played a positive role in the elaboration of that particular uh, provision in the 1980s. It's also a party to the Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities. Um, but I think it's the Covenant on Civil Political Rights that is uh, front and center in our discussion. I'm suggesting to you that the three main components of the right are those that you can see on the screen. Front and center is the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation of life. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what that notion means. But increasingly over the last uh, 20 years, there has been an acceptance of the duty to protect life as part of this uh, triad of obligations for all human rights to respect first and foremost, the duty on the state to protect against interference by others, uh, in particular non-state actors, and then uh, the corresponding duty to investigate suspicious uh, death. So first, with respect to arbitrary deprivation of life, uh, as you can see by the notion of the formulation, not all taking of life by the state is unlawful. It is only when it is arbitrary. And by arbitrary, we mean when it violates international law or if domestic law is more protective, also domestic law. Especially important as we're going to look at are the international legal rules governing the use of force. So let's focus first of all on use of force by uh, the police and other law enforcement officials. This is a broad term in international law. Uh, and while our primary focus uh, will be the police, there are other law enforcement officials 
the security forces, for example, the military, when they are doing law enforcement tasks and not engaging in the waging of war, then they are also regulated uh, by these rules. For example, as you know, the military in certain countries are involved in public order management. So uh, the management of uh, public assemblies, for example, uh, certain use of force by the military in peacekeeping would fall to be considered as a law enforcement task. But whoever the actor is, as you can see, all use of force must comply with these two fundamental principles, necessity and proportionality. And those of you uh, with expertise in different branches of international law will know that those terms are used in different branches and with a different meaning. So the same uh, principle, the same word, necessity, will appear in other branches like the law of armed conflict we're going to talk about in a minute, like uh, the law on interstate use of force, which we'll also uh, touch on. Proportionality likewise appears in these other bodies uh, of uh, international law. So it's important that we understand how they apply in the uh, context of law enforcement. As you can see, there are three elements to the principle of necessity. It allows only minimum necessary force. And that use of force must be for a legitimate law enforcement purpose. That means, for example, of course, that the extraction of bribes, that intimidation, that discrimination are inherently unlawful, as none is a legitimate law enforcement purpose. Such a purpose would be the uh, uh, lawful arrest of a criminal suspect or uh, the prevention of crime. And then this third element is also an extension of necessity, that use of force is only permissible for as long as necessary. What we mean by that is if the, a suspect is not only in custody, but is also not resisting, uh, then no further use of force will be permissible. So, for example, if you are uh, a, a criminal a suspect who's been arrested, you may be handcuffed if it's a, a serious offence, but that still potentially allows you to use other uh, parts of your uh, body to attack the arresting officer. You can kick him or her, you can bite, all these kind of things. So by uh, the notion of only as long as necessary, we mean not only uh, that the suspect is in custody, but is also not resisting arrest or proving to be violent. Proportionality only comes into play if necessity is already being complied with. So the two uh, principles, necessity and proportionality, are cumulative. And if a law enforcement official breaches either of these principles, then normally a violation of human rights will have occurred. If uh, the person uh, is injured as a result of unlawful use of force, then uh, a violation of the right to freedom from torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment uh, may have occurred. If the person uh, is killed or if he or she is seriously injured, and I'll come back to that issue in a minute, then, of course, the right to life is more likely to have been uh, violated. Proportionality, then, refers to the use of force in relation to the threat that a person uh, poses or uh, the crime, the harm uh, to be uh, avoided. What it effect does is sets a ceiling on what force will be permissible. So there may be force that is necessary in the circumstances, but which is nonetheless 
unlawful by virtue of proportionality. And as we shall see, a key example of that is the uh, international rule in relation to the use of firearms. So use of a firearm by a law enforcement official must meet these two uh, cumulative obligations. It must be necessary in the circumstances, and by necessity here, we mean that alternative, less uh, deadly uh, uh, means of achieving the law enforcement purpose must not be uh, reasonable in the circumstances. But even if uh, force is necessary in the circumstances and the fire, use of a firearm is the only reasonable way to achieve it, firearm use is only permissible to confront an imminent threat to life or of serious injury. What that means, as you can see, is that the use of firearms by the police purely to protect property or with a view to dispersing an assembly, even if that assembly is unlawful and unauthorized, is not permissible. That does not, of course, mean that other forms of uh, force that are less lethal may not be used. Of course, they may, subject uh, to compliance with the principles of necessity and proportionality. But the use of potentially deadly force through a firearm will not. The uh, rules uh, specific to firearms is in effect a, um, uh, a manifestation of uh, that rule of proportionality. I can see uh, there's a question in, in the uh, chat and there's a hand up. Maybe I'll go to the hand up. Uh, perhaps the organizers can help me find the hand. Um, Shruti, did you want to ask a question now? Okay, they have law at their hands, so maybe you can continue them through. Okay, but please, uh, uh, to everyone, don't uh, don't hesitate uh, to uh, put your hand up or, or uh, put uh, the chat. Now, uh, Akshita uh, has put a question in the chat. How can a state decide the standard of uh, proportionality? It's a very broad term. That's absolutely right, uh, Akshita. It is a, a, a very... Uh, a broad term. Now, I've given you one example uh, of uh, proportionality, the use of firearm, uh, where we have a specific rule that helps us to understand where proportionality uh, is fixed. Uh, in other respects, we would look to uh, the, hum the regional human rights courts. I know that doesn't uh, apply to India specifically. We would look to, uh, for example, the UN treaty bodies. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Human Rights Committee that oversees the implementation of the covenant as to how they uh, seek to define that uh, term. But to give you an, an, another example, um, uh, many law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, perhaps not in India, but many uh, law enforcement agencies use uh, conducted energy devices, um, most popularly known by their uh, brand, uh, the particular brand called Taser. And uh, taser is quite a significant level of force. It's uh, sending a current uh, through two barbs into your body, causing neuromuscular incapacitation. So it's quite a significant uh, level of force. And the temptation on some law enforcement officials is to use it as some form of intimidation or some form of punishment. Um, now, we don't have a clear rule in international treaty law that says uh, that that uh, specifically would be unlawful, but we do have indications. Uh, some of the very good work that's been done uh, by the United States Department of Justice, the Civil Rights uh, Division of the DOJ, has talked to this uh, particular issue. So while you're right to say it's a broad term, there are indications that we can get from uh, either jurisprudence, other state practice, uh, or uh, guidelines uh, by experts. But I think uh, to, to your second question, do any fixed standards uh, occur? 
in, in terms of implementation of proportionality, it's the firearms rule uh, that is the one that is the best example. All right, thank you, Professor. Thanks. So, oh, sorry, did I miss? Oh, uh, Mohammed's asked, how do we define a legitimate uh, purpose? So states have decided uh, what a legitimate purpose uh, is uh, in a couple of uh, soft law instruments, uh, but which uh, reflect customary law today. The first of these is the 1979 Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials. And the second is the 1990 Basic Principles on the Use of Force and Firearms by Law Enforcement. Uh, officials. And in that, they indicate that uh, the uh, that law enforcement is the detection of crime and the arrest of criminal suspects. And I gave you some examples of behavior that you understand is clearly not uh, legitimate intimidation, punishment, uh, and so on. I'm touching here uh, relatively briefly on the use of the death penalty, because I know that this continues to be an issue uh, in India. Sorry, I see there's another question in the chat. Um, Seeds asked uh, whether necessity and proportionality are administrative matters. No, these are substantive principles uh, that apply to law enforcement, no matter what country uh, it, it may be, and no matter what treaties that country has adhered to, these are general principles of law and customary rules that apply uh, to all states. And I don't think you would hear a state denying those principles. More often, you'll see a state denying that it violated those principles or questioning the interpretation of those principles. In terms of the uh, use of the death penalty, uh, there is at least an emerging rule towards the progressive abolition of the death penalty. And certainly the number of states that have the death penalty on their stat statute book and that use the death penalty, uh, not only uh, in imposition of sentence, but also in execution of sentence, continues uh, to reduce. But even in those states that retain the death penalty, like India, it is clear that it must be only for the most serious crimes. And uh, in its uh, general comment, its most recent uh, general comment on the right to life, which it agreed in 2018, the Human Rights Committee has reiterated its view that that means homicide. And that means the perpetration of homicide, not complicity in homicide. For example, giving the weapon to an individual who then goes and kills someone. Again, of course, that doesn't for a second mean that people that have committed other crimes do not uh, require and deserve punishment. It's only that the death penalty is not the appropriate punishment for that offence. You've asked, uh, Gisanne, about the deterrence purpose uh, of the uh, death penalty. Um, I'm not sure there's a good answer to that one. You will see both sides uh, argue very strongly, but without necessarily having the evidence to support it. So I'm going to s dodge, if you don't mind, that question, because I don't have a really good answer for you, other than to say uh, views are clearly passionately held on both sides. What I think has been shown is that the death penalty is not cheap. Some people suggested in the past it was a more efficient method of dealing with serious criminals. I think the evidence in most states uh, does uh, tend to uh, belie that. But in any event, in any country that does not abolish the death penalty, it must be a fair trial. There must be the possibility to appeal against sentence uh, and conviction. And uh, one of the other important points that was reiterated uh, by the Human Rights Committee in its general comment in 2018 is that the mandatory death penalty is inherently arbitrary. Why? Because you cannot tailor the sentence 
to fit either the crime or the criminal who has perpetrated it. There is no possibility of uh, mitigation in applying that sentence. Of course, there may be the possibility of a pardon, but human rights law requires that there be the possibility for the sentence to be appropriately tailored. Now, one of the strengths of uh, the right to life, and in particular, this formulation of arbitrary deprivation of life being prohibited, is that it allows human rights law to draw on other branches of international law. I've given you the example of law enforcement, and uh, in that respect, arbitrary deprivation of life looks at whether the use of force was necessary and proportionate in law enforcement terms. But that same principle, relying on other bodies of law, also applies to situations of armed conflict. Now, there are two main bodies of law. There are others we could talk about, but these are the two principal ones that apply to uh, the use of force in relation to an armed conflict. I'll deal briefly with Yusad Bellum, and uh, I should stress that this is controversial. In its uh, 2018 general comment on the right to life, the Human Rights Committee upset a number of governments, France, the UK, the United States, Canada, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Germany, by suggesting that an act of aggression was also a violation of the right to life. Now, nobody contests that the, an act of aggression is a violation of international law, one of the most serious violations of international law. But what upset these uh, Western uh, nations was the notion that the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation of life would incorporate this prohibition on the perpetration of aggression. Aggression being a serious violation of uh, the prohibition on use of force, either against uh, the territorial integrity or the political independence of another state. Obvious example uh, being uh, the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait uh, in 1990. Uh, not many uh, international lawyers would contest that that was an act of uh, aggression. Okay, I can see a couple of raised hands, so bear with me while I try and find uh, which ones. Why am I not seeing? Can you uh, help me out with who's put their hand up? Uh, sure, I'll do it. Um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, they're right at the top. Sorry, I was uh, yeah. struggling. Let me get back up there. So we have uh, Salkan and then Akshita again. Uh, Salkan, please. Hi, thank you, Prof, uh, for, for the presentation. I just want to ask you a question. Where do you draw the line when it's come, when we're talking about specifically uh, right to live? And when you have the suspension of right to live, um, is it in the like a, a conflict zone, armed conflict zone, which is declared as a non-governable or where you draw the line? Because I think there is definitely a gray area. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Salkan. So uh, just to emphasize very clearly that it's the right to life and not the right to live. Um, there is uh, no uh, right to live, just as it would appear, there is no right to die. But we could have a lot of uh, discussions uh, uh, on that. Um, but this is uh, one issue. So uh, if you talk about right to live, what that often means is uh, you are uh, straying into the issue about when life starts as a matter of law. And of course, uh, the American Convention on Human Rights talks about the protection of the, uh, of the right to life from the moment of conception. So that's why we tend to, 
stay away from uh, that notion of the right to live, uh, the right to live. But uh, the issue that you raised about um, the uh, existence of the right in a conflict zone, uh, it is very clear, and I, I will come to that uh, in just a second, but it is very clear that the right to life is not suspended during a situation of armed conflict. But it may be, and uh, I would argue it is, subject to differing interpretation. If you're okay, I will come back to that issue, uh, uh, which I was going to deal with in a couple of uh, minutes. Now, there was another hand. Akshita again, please. Hello, Professor. So uh, my question basically is that technically, an act of aggression itself does violate life in general. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I am not aware of there being any specific rules or boundaries that actually govern such acts of aggression when they take place. So uh, why would it be so problematic or what in your opinion would be the best way to deal with actually this act of aggression coming within the definition of arbitrary de deprivation of life? Um, thank you, Akshita. Uh, I'm not sure I've got a, um, a very clear strategy. Uh, what I've argued and continue uh, to argue is that, uh, just as you've said, um, it would seem to be logical um, that uh, arbitrary deprivation of life would result from uh, an act of aggression. Back in 1982, when the Human Rights Committee issued its first general comment on the right to life, uh, general comment number six, it didn't go quite as far. It indicated that arbitrary life would occur or could occur in the context uh, of aggression, but it didn't come out and say quite as strongly as uh, it did uh, three years ago that actually the act of aggression leads to arbitrary uh, deprivation of life covered by the uh, covenant. What we are seeing is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, significant opposition from states. Now, uh, that will be tested at some point before uh, some, uh, um, whether it be the, the Human Rights Committee or uh, some other uh, regional uh, human rights court. So I think there will be jurisprudence that either supports or, or runs counter to uh, that assertion. But I think it's clear that it is controversial. Sorry, did I see? Yeah. Uh, Professor, I'm sorry. Uh, I just had one small follow-up question to this. Sure. So, as you mentioned that uh, the act of aggression itself, which largely depends on state sovereignty and international law broadly, or even the UN Charter itself specifies the sovereignty. So, do you actually think there is a scope for such uh, acts of aggression being termed within arbitrary deprivation of life, seeing that it can challenge, challenge state sovereignty broadly? Well, uh... I mean, human rights uh, are a challenge to state sovereignty. They are restrictions on what the state may lawfully do. So uh, the very notion of human rights is saying to a state, I don't care what you do domestically, um, what you decide to do uh, uh, by uh, domestic law, some of your acts will still violate international law. That is the very nature of human rights law itself. The challenge is where that boundary lays and whether uh, we are always pushing back against uh, this notion of sovereignty successfully or not. Let me uh, push on a little bit and then we can come back to uh, those issues uh, a little later. So just to conclude, uh, 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 aggression considered by the Human Rights Committee to be an arbitrary deprivation of life, but a controversial issue. Also uh, controversial, but less so, is the relationship between the law of armed conflict, IHL, and uh, the right to life. So uh, what the uh, International Court of Justice uh, said is that when we apply the right to life in a situation of armed conflict, and in particular to the use of force, the conduct of hostilities, then you must look at the rules of IHL and not the rules of law enforcement. There's a, an obvious logic uh, to that. 
what I've done is uh, put there, for those of you who are not experts in IHL, the two primary rules that govern the use of force in a situation of armed conflict. First and foremost, as you can see, is the principle of distinction. And this requires that during an armed conflict, whether it be between two or more states or between a state and an organized non-state armed group, you must target only military objectives, whether that be people or objects, and not civilians or civilian objects. The definition of a military objective under IHL, however, is broad, not just those objects that are by their nature military, a tank, a garrison, uh, a gun, all those uh, kind of things you understand, but also those that are used by the military for military purposes. And that would apply, for example, to a school. A school ordinarily, of course, a civilian object, but if a military force takes over that school or uses that school for storage of weapons, for example, then uh, that transforms at least that part of the building into a lawful military objective. Civilians who are ordinarily protected against attack lose their immunity if they participate directly in hostilities. Now, the most obvious form uh, of participation, of direct participation, is of course to pick up a gun or uh, to fire a missile or whatever it may be. Um, but again, this is controversial. It is clear, however, that the notion of direct participation is broader, probably extending to the transmission of tactical information, even by someone who is unarmed. If and only if the principle of distinction is respected, then uh, you have this principle of proportionality in, in attack. And I mentioned we see this notion of proportionality in different branches of international law applying or meaning different things. And here's a very clear example. The notion of proportionality attack is balancing the military advantage you expect from that attack against the civilian harm that you anticipate will occur. So you're projecting forward in time as a military commander and looking at what that uh, harm may be. And then we have this uh, admittedly very vague notion of excessive. What is successive uh, civilian harm? We could talk about that more uh, in the Q&A uh, later if you like. So here's uh, the key statements from the ICJ. There is no possibility for the right to life to be derogated under uh, the covenant on civil and political rights. It therefore applies at all times. And that was the first statement that the ICJ was making. In principle, the right applies in hostilities. But it then goes on and explains, uh, and you can see the logic, that a situation of war is not the same as a situation of peace. So the right, the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation, must be interpreted rather differently. And there we're talking about the uh, rules applicable in armed conflict. First and foremost are uh, distinction and proportionality that we've uh, just mentioned. Oops. Sorry. The, sorry, there were a couple of questions. I, um, if you may, if I may, I'll come back to capture and kill uh, at the uh, end. Oh, you've got a lot of questions on, on uh, law of armed conflict. Uh, they're all good questions. Uh, maybe, uh, Samir Gareth, I'll come back to those in the Q&A. Um, so if you can just make sure that I don't uh, slip my mind, uh, and I will come back to those. The, uh, so the primary uh, rule uh, in the right to life we've looked at is the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation. The uh, secondary rule, if I can put it that way, is, as you can see, the duty to protect life. With the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation, we're looking at the duty to respect life. So we're focusing on the actions of the state and its agents. 
whether that be the, the military, the security forces, the police, and so on. But it is clear that there is also a duty to protect life against interference from others. Now, back in 1966, the focus was on, as you can see, protection by law. What do we mean by that? Well, of course, we mean the prohibition of murder or other forms of unlawful homicide. And uh, subsequently, it is understood that there is also a duty to act to prevent loss of life, not just by uh, your own uh, agents as a state, but also by non-state actors and ordinary citizens and individuals. And therefore, as the Human Rights Committee uh, pointed out uh, a couple of years ago, a legal framework must be established to ensure the full enjoyment of the right to life by all individuals. That's going beyond this notion, of course, of criminalizing homicide to look at other uh, protections, because there are other ways uh, that you may uh, lose your life than being killed. And here's uh, the rule uh, that is reflective today of customary international law. It's the uh, general comment again with respect to the covenant, but this applies uh, more generally. And the standard that we talk about, as you can see, uh, highlighted in the quote, is due diligence. What do we mean by due diligence? We mean all reasonable effort. You cannot, however uh, efficient an authority you are, you cannot prevent all loss of life. You cannot prevent one neighbor killing another. It's just not possible. But uh, you must do everything that is reasonably within your, uh, your power and your uh, remit to prevent uh, loss of life, even, at your, uh, even if it's not at your own hands or those of your agents. And here we see reasonable, foreseeable, life-threatening situations. So uh, here are a few examples uh, that I think are particularly important of where uh, the state must seek to prevent loss of life at the hands of other actors. Of course, the obvious one, killings by uh, non-state actors, but there are also, uh, and, and killings of children, uh, uh, femicide and so on, but there are also today these broader threats that are arising from pollution and from climate change. Here we're seeing the right to life being broadened, I think, in scope from a focus on extrajudicial execution in the uh, 1960s and through the 1970s and 80s to these uh, issues of harm or threat uh, to life that may not be just the use of force. The last uh, of our uh, three uh, main elements of the right to life, which are a corollary of uh, the first two, is, as you can see, the duty to investigate uh, suspicious death. And again, the focus in uh, the 1980s, uh, there were principles endorsed by the UN General Assembly on the investigation and prevention of extrajudicial executions. The focus has broadened now to an understanding that the right to life means every suspicious death, irrespective of whether the state's involvement is suspected, must be investigated. The duty to investigate, again, applies not just in peacetime, but also in armed conflict. And a, a soft law uh, instrument that was published by the uh, United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2017, but was concluded the year before, sets out detailed guidance on how a death investigation should be conducted. And this, although not a treaty, is being used as the standard for investigations. It reiterates, and this is uh, clear from uh, case law and um, 
opinions from UN treaty bodies that these four uh, criteria must be uh, respected. First and foremost, and the most important, is that the investigation must be effective and thorough. Now, that does not mean that you necessarily find the perpetrator or the cause. It may be impossible in the circumstances to find out who killed the person or even if that person was unlawfully killed. But you must, again, exercise due diligence, all reasonable effort to seek to make that determination. Was it suicide, homicide, natural death, accidental death? If it was unlawful killing, who was responsible and responsibility, of course, in the broad uh, term. Independence and impartiality, a big issue I know in the context of India and uh, the uh, all reasonable effort standard is most easily satisfied when you have an autopsy. And uh, I'll come back to uh, autopsy in a minute. I mentioned uh, briefly uh, the UN uh, mechanisms. Uh, key, of course, is the Special Rapporteur for the Right to Life. Uh, key is the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary of Arbitrary Executions. At that time, uh, it was uh, Professor Christoph uh, Haynes who conducted an official visit to India in March 2012. Indeed, it was the um, uh, discussion that he had with a number of uh, Indian forensic doctors that led to his action to help uh, the UN to revise the Minnesota Protocol. They said to him, um, the existing text from 1991 is now out of date. We have DNA testing, we have digital photography, we have more advanced uh, autopsy uh, procedures, and those are not reflected. Uh, also, the right to life, uh, as we've looked at, has progressed over the last uh, 30, 25, 30 years. And so they called on him to revise the instrument. But in terms of what he saw uh, in India, he raised particular concerns about extrajudicial executions and uh, focused on impunity as being the central problem. He recommended a number of recommendations, um, but three I think are uh, particularly relevant uh, to us. The need for a commission, a credible commission of inquiry into extrajudicial, suspected extrajudicial executions, a repeal of the AF SPA, both generally and in uh, Kashmir, and uh, to revise uh, the grounds for the death penalty. The uh, India has not come before the Human Rights Committee. All uh, states come every few years before the uh, committee, but has not come uh, in the last uh, 24 years, I think it was, 97, if my memory serves me right, was the last time uh, India came before. But uh, as you can see, a couple of years ago, the Human Rights Committee, expecting India to come before it soon, sets out what is called a list of issues. These are uh, issues that the committee considers are of particular concern to the specific country. And uh, it's a detailed document, it's, it's available online. I've just picked out uh, a couple that are most relevant to us because of course the committee is not just looking at the right to life, they're looking at all the rights that are protected in the covenant. And here again, you can see some of those that are most important. They've also asked for what they call information on measures for accountability, so addressing that issue of impunity, uh, progress towards the abolishing the death penalty. They mention again the use of the death penalty for what they consider are not the most serious uh, crimes, and then uh, reports of deaths in custody, and a particular concern about what they describe as biased autopsy results. Very uh, big concern that forensic doctors are not uh, reliably reporting the cause of uh, death in a particular case, because that's the, uh, a fundamental part of an effective and thorough investigation. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm sorry I ran over a little bit, uh, but you've had a lot of uh, good questions. Um, maybe I'll turn over to you uh, 
uh, Samir, if you want to moderate, if not, I can dive into uh, some of those questions. I'm happy for you to dive into questions, Stuart. And if people have questions, they can put them in the chat or if they want to be seen in the recording, just raise your hand and we will call upon you to, to speak and ask your question directly. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the first one is a little bit of, a little bit philosophical, if you don't mind me uh, uh, suggesting, Sarabi. Um, uh, as you know, the the standard definition of the state is um, one that claims uh, legitimacy uh, over the use of force. Um, it is clear that, that that force is necessary in certain circumstances for law and order. The question is where that boundary uh, e exists. Does the existence? Stuart, could I request you to stop sharing your screen so that people can see? Oh, you I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. of course. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Is that gone? Yes. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Apologies for uh, that. Let me uh, have a look. Um, Ian's put a very good question. Does the existence of due diligence as a standard? Um, effectively mean the state can use its ability to have control over private actors as a mitigating factor. I'm not sure I'd describe it as a mitigating factor. What I think it is saying is uh, that you cannot expect any state, no matter how well organized, to prevent all loss of life. It's just not feasible. You have uh, everyday murders that are committed by private citizens. The police cannot be everywhere. What I think is um, one of the emerging trends is uh, the, the conduct that is being expected uh, of the state. Now, I mentioned the standard of due diligence and all reasonable effort, and, and that is the standard that applies. But one of the debates that's going on within the European Court of Human Rights uh, these days is in relation to the problems of domestic violence uh, in uh, Europe, as indeed I think every continent, we have a terrible problem of uh, domestic violence. And uh, what the European Court is wrestling with, they haven't come down firmly on either side yet, but what they're wrestling with is, is there a heightened standard? Because you may not have a simple threat by the husband to the wife, uh, for example, I'm going to kill you. What you might have is an increase uh, in gradations, a a, uh, a, um, a long-standing threat that grows in intensity? And is there a heightened standard uh, on the uh, part of the state to address this? Uh, it's one of those emerging issues that I think has not yet coalesced. If I may ask a small follow-up, Professor. That's yes, okay. please, go ahead. Yeah, so, but, but I understand the uh, concept, like the standard itself and what concerns me is the extension of it. So for instance, there are states like Mexico, which, which often argue that, oh, we can't control the cartels, for instance. Right? And, and states essentially have no effective power and are not able to do anything at all. But, and the worry is that doesn't due diligence as a standard then allow them to get away with that? Because in a, even if you can't control every person, if it's an institutional problem, uh, for your law enforcement or for your uh, for your ability as a government to, to act in the first place. What happens then? Like, how does due diligence as a standard deal with that? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Ian. Yes, uh, to a certain extent, uh, you're right. It does serve um, in certain circumstances as some kind of a mitigating factor. But equally, um, that is to underestimate also, I think, the... Um, uh, the process of investigation by the courts. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you look at, uh, clearly not in relation to India, but for example, in Moldova, you've got this autonomous area called Transnistria. And there are a number of cases where the court has said, yes, we know that this is controlled uh, by the Transnistrians and with support from the Russians, but we want to see what you actually did. You, just, you can't just throw up your hands and say, there's nothing we can do. Did you make diplomatic remonstrations? Did when individuals came into your territory, did you arrest them? Did you in investigate? There are things that you can do. So to a certain extent, yes, you're right. Uh, 
uh, there is a, a bit of a get out clause, but equally, I think uh, courts are pushing back and saying, you, you, this is not a get out of jail free card in the sense of you don't just flash the word non-state actors and, and then uh, no consequences for your own respect for the right to life. So it's, it's a Thank kind you. of partial yes, partial no. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mohammed's asked one about, um, yes, using violence, not directly, but through non-state actors. Um, that is an, a, an act of aggression, uh, Mohammed. By the international definition of aggression, the sending of armed groups on your behalf, so not using your own armed forces, but using armed groups under international law, that is also an act of aggression. And uh, that would also engage in armed conflict between your state and the, uh, the victim state. So th that is, you, you don't get around the prohibition of, of aggression uh, that way. Let me see. Um, uh, Ananya has asked about where there's a right to life violation by the non-state actor, would the state be responsible uh, for reparations or compensation? Um, uh, potentially, uh, yes. Um, now, I didn't go into it in the presentation because I didn't want to st steer too far away from our central concern, but there is an ongoing discussion about the responsibility of non-state actors themselves for violation of the right to life. That is, and I say it front and centre, controversial. Not everyone uh, agrees, but the United Nations has moved very firmly in that uh, direction. Now, you might say there are some non-state actors that don't care about the right to life, and that is true, but others do care about the right to life. And you've seen even long-standing non-state actors that have, for example, apologized for actions, have made some kind of um, reparative either statement or act uh, to the victims. So uh, yes, the state will be responsible when it fails its due diligence obligations, but also, I think we shouldn't shy away from a discussion about the responsibility of those actors themselves. And some of those actors in some states become the government in years to come, and their international law is clearer, they are responsible uh, for those acts. Um, Neha's asked, how does the, the right of civilians to carry firearms uh, reconcile with the obligation of the state to ensure due diligence? Um, I'm not sure there's a clear answer to this question. There has been a little bit of uh, debate within the Human Rights Council in the last few years on this. Uh, states like uh, Peru and Mexico are very concerned because not just do you have the situation where in the US you have the right to bear arms, but some of the violence by the drug cartels is uh, fueled by the ready access of these cartels over the border in the United States. They go over to uh, a small uh, gun dealer and uh, with the provision of enough money, they go away with weapons, bring them over the border uh, uh, and so on. So these are issues that are, are not clearly resolved, but they are issues that are, are bubbling away in human rights law. Sure, there are a few hands. Uh... Do, do you want to direct me, Samir, to, to some of the yeah. hands? Sorry. <laughs> Can Kavita go and ask her question, please? Oh, hi. Happy New Year to all, and thanks for letting me ask a question. Uh, so, sir, my question pertains to the fact that what if uh, there's a particular country who's depriving their own citizens the, the, the right to life? Um, however, this is not pertaining to an armed conflict. It's during peacetime for, say, national security reasons. Then in that case, can another country, maybe for enforceability of the right to life of these individuals who have been deprived, can they drag this particular country to the ICJ or like um, uh, without particularly breaching, maybe say the sovereignty part of this nations because nations are going to invoke sovereignty clauses for this, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Kavita. Um, the answer is, is no but. Um, you, you can't drag states before the ICJ. Um, if you've accepted the compulsory jurisdiction, then they're, they're not being dragged, they're going of their own accord. Um, but you can't drag them uh, before it. If you wanted to be um, uh, clever or, or uh, 
uh, whatever, you could ask for an advisory opinion if you could get the sufficient support within the General Assembly. But um, there are situations, um, they're relatively few, but there are situations in where issues of fundamental human rights have been adjudicated. And I'm thinking particularly about the uh, Guinea-Senegal case. Um, uh, I think it was Guinea-Senegal, might be Guinea-Congo. Uh, anyway, uh, concerned a Congolese uh, citizen. Um, so you, you have that aspect within the ICJ, but don't forget you also have the ICC. Um, and one of the interesting trends that we're seeing at the moment is where states that are not party to it, Israel, the United States, are potentially going to uh, at least have their names sullied, if not their, their uh, members of their armed forces dragged uh, before the court. It's extending uh, the, um, the writ of the court in areas that I guess the US were very fearful of uh, back in the 1990s when it was being uh, when the statute was being negotiated. So um, you might not be able to drag a state before a particular tribunal, but you can nonetheless put some pressure on. And when you have a serious widespread uh, violation of, uh, of rights, including the right to life, you do have this, albeit contested, uh, notion of responsibility to protect, but it is a notion whereby you are pushing uh, against states that engage in this. Commissions of inquiry before... Uh, uh, authorized by the Human Rights Council are a similar, similar mechanism for embarrassing states and starting to build evidence uh, towards some kind of uh, a remedy. Uh, next, Jizan Riaz, can you please unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, this is Jizan. Uh, so, since we're discussing right life from a border perspective over here, my question is related to the AFSAPA, that's the Armed Forces Special Power Act. Since I've lived my entire life, I'm based out of Kashmir, so I've been able to see the entire fiasco from a vantage point. So AFSAPA provides unrestrained authority and impunity to the armed forces to carry out certain, uh, to combat terrorism or carry out certain anti-terrorist activities in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So the narrative that's been held by the armed forces and the government is that since an army officer is to carry out an anti-terror operation, so he needs some sort of impunity and he should not be held accountable if at all any mishap occurs in relation to that. So, but I want to, I want to ask for that. Don't you think all the heinous crime that have been committed by the armed forces, such as Kunhan Pushpura, Bijbahara massacre, and the list just goes on under the shadows of Aksava, clearly and prima facie violates right to life. So what are the provisions as far as India is concerned with, re with regards to uh, also, also, it, also it has been, it has ratified the covenants of ICCPR back in 1979. So even after ratifying a treaty, which is, which clearly talks about right to life from a broader, broader angle. So don't you think the unrestrained authority on the armed forces here in, uh, here in the state of Jammu and Kashmir violates uh, right to life, you know, from a, from a broader perspective. So what's your take on that? Uh, thanks very much, Jason. And that also refers to um, a, a question that's that's in the chat itself. Um, uh, I think you're right. Where you have uh, any instrument that uh, institutes de jure impunity for all acts that are committed, whether or not they are un uh, whether or not they are lawful, that is clearly a violation of human rights law. The very essence of human rights is that there should be no. Uh, blanket immunity and uh, impunity. So uh, I mentioned uh, towards the end of my presentation the list of issues uh, when India does come before the Human Rights Committee, and you can be sure that that issue will come up in the in the uh, discussions. Now, uh, the the second, I guess, part of your question is what are the consequences uh, of that? And uh, the consequences are not going to be, uh, as we said earlier, that India is going to be dragged before the ICC or the ICJ. But nonetheless, I think a finding by the Human Rights Committee that these provisions are inherently unlawful, are inherently in violation of the covenant, I think that is one small, but nonetheless important step forward. And maybe in years to come, maybe that will uh, persuade the authorities to um, uh, remove that particular uh, notion of impunity. Uh, so, uh, 
there's one more follow up question with regards to the same like if you may permit sure uh, so since i'm not well versed with international law i would like to ask you are there any provisions in the international law wherein the armed forces are to be tried in civil courts say for example if 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 any particular member of the armed forces is held accountable for any of the heinous crimes committed so in those cases uh, the army personals are normally tried in an army court in a military court the hearing the hearing of which is not Uh, made public so the general public does not actually know if an army officer is tried or not so are there any are there any provisions in the international law which states that an army personal if he's uh, if he's held guilty of any crime he should be tried in a civil court then uh, then the uh, military court um no uh, jizan th- that what what there is is kind of the other way round about civilians not being tried in military courts that happens in a number of uh, countries where i work for example Uh, in the uh, Lake Chad Basin, uh, that's a particular concern that you have civilians that are suspected of terrorist offences that are being tried in military courts or uh, with military judges. Um, but it is accepted uh, that um, military tribunals may be convened to um, uh, prosecute uh, members of the armed forces, and I personally don't see it very likely that that situation. is going to change what i think we can say is that there is a duty of transparency upon the state to disclose uh, where a prosec- where an investigation has occurred and where a prosecution has occurred whether or not uh, that is successful but even that uh, is uh, a challenge uh, i would say in international law as it stands today thanks to it uh, can i ask sheikh yamina to unmute herself and ask the question oh hello professor thank you so much for giving me an opportunity uh, professor my questions i have two questions uh, the first question is you talked about the principle of distinction like uh, i want to ask that uh, i think it is a more broader perspective as you said and it's not being specified i think the states are getting uh, taking a veil of these principles they are trying to inculcate more crimes and uh, trying to uh, justify those crimes by being more the principles being more broad and not specific the second uh, question is like uh, i think there is a absence of common reasonable effort there is not a common reasonable standard that all states must apply that leads to a human rights violation uh so how can we actually bring a common reasonable standard and how to make states accountable for that i um, hope you get my yes and, and and if i if i don't uh, answer your question sufficiently please come back to me but um i think it's inevitable uh, that when you set out rules for uh, for example the conduct of hostilities in in uh, international humanitarian law that some of those rules will be a uh, general and will be broad i don't think there's inherently a problem with that where i think the problem uh, lies is for example you mentioned the principle of distinction um we have in ihl a very low standard of requirement it's not all reasonable effort to identify a lawful military target it's all feasible measures that i think is is most definitely a problem and 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 overcoming that heightening that standard Uh, will be uh, a real challenge the other uh, issue with the principle of dist- distinction is it is accepted in ihl that you can aim at a target and miss and one of the problems is what we don't know is how much you can miss by so if you uh, you kill a woman instead of uh, a suspected uh, terrorist who is armed and uh, and whatever the the question is how much could you miss by before that becomes either a violation of human rights or even a criminal law violation so i think you're right we still have a, lo- a lot of work to do um but i'm not sure it's it's just the uh, that we can necessarily override the, the general principle i think it's more we do need clear guidance on what compliance with that principle is I stood before we take uh, any more raised hands questions there is a question in the chat box uh, by Shubh Mathur uh, the question is it's quite clear that the indian state violates the right to life in kashmir on a daily and even hourly basis what redress is available to victims when domestic courts continue to maintain impunity for the perpetrators 
Um, I, I wish I had a perfect answer uh, to that, but I'm afraid I don't. What I do think you can say is documenting those cases reliably with evidence using human rights language increases the possibility that uh, uh, treaty bodies uh, will pick up on that language. Now, uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned uh, earlier on that one of the big problems is um, India has not uh, ratified a single individual complaints procedure in relation to the human rights treaties. It's party to some very important ones, not just the covenant on civil political rights, but the convention on the elimination of discrimination against discrimination uh, against women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. All of these have uh, individual complaints procedures. India is not party to any of them. And that, I think, is a real obstacle to the kind of uh, justice that you're talking about. But the uh, India does still come before each of these committees every few years. And uh, NGOs can submit information on violations the more reliable, um, dispassionate, I realize it's difficult to be dispassionate when, when confronted with uh, very serious uh, violations of uh, human rights law, but the more dispassionate, the more factual uh, that you can be, the more chance that these committees will pick up on this language and will refer to it in their concluding observations. And I think always building the case that there is not just uh, individual violations, but as you said, a pattern of violations, I think, uh, is a step towards uh, addressing the problem of, uh, of impunity. Thanks, Stuart. Can I ask Sal Khan to unmute and ask the question, please? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my actually name is Salman Khan, and I don't know why it is shortcut my email, Sal Khan. Anyway, thank you. Uh, Prof. Uh, my name is Salman Khan from South African Kashmiri Action Group in Johannesburg. Um, I have a two question. One is when I look at all the slides that you put it out there, so comprehensive, and it, it addresses every single aspect, almost like always every aspect of a uh, human life, the dignity, the protection, and so on and on. But but uh, the duplicity or the dichotomy of this application of the law is very precarious because you look at in in in, in Kashmir, it's over 100,000 people have been died, and uh, when you have a few thousand people died in uh, Iraq, uh, the application of this law become immediately applicable, and the uh, the United Nations Security Council issue a seven resolution to to make sure that NATO force is landed. So when is the time? that you have over 100,000 people died, almost like a semi-genocide, and the, the ineffectiveness of the United Nations. My second question is being that we launched, not we launched, we brought a very successful case, a historical case from South Africa of a war crime when the Moody was visiting in South Africa in 2011 during the uh, BRICS conference, the war crime, and we had a warrant, warrant of arrest, and he was given a presidential immunity to come to South Africa under the jurist that he will not be arrested. Now, the, the, the case is still on. The MP have requested a visa for an investigative team to go to, because we have a premier Faki case, and we, we uh, the NPA has requested uh, the visas to Indian embassy to go to Srinagar to investigate further, and they refused. They said this is an internal matter. So uh, I just need to understand that, you know, when is the this this responsibility from country to go to the icg and or the united nation and they said now there is enough evidence that this investigation need to be opened there is a two investigation pending which is the united nation report which is uh, 2017 and 18 49 pages and 73 pages and india is always been uh, not hiding i would say circumventing in a way to appear in front of the united nation uh, uh, what you call it, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and as you rightly said, uh, that uh, we cannot drag India to the ICG and CIG, uh, ICC and C. So I'm very confused. I mean, in the same mechanism, there is a protection, and in the same mechanism, there is a law, and, and how, when, what time, when it will be, that it will be become applicable to the India. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've got a... Um, a good answer to uh, your, your question. You're absolutely right uh, to point out that there are uh, manifest injustices in the international legal order that we have. Uh, I would say only that the more evidence uh, 
that is put down, the more that your, uh, your work uh, identifies these issues, the greater the chance uh, in the future that something will happen. Um, the Human Rights Council does issue uh, commissions uh, of inquiry, um, which again, sometimes are not allowed into the country. The inquiry into the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, for example, was not allowed uh, to visit the country, but can still put together a very detailed report and can still find that crimes against humanity were committed. So uh, without suggesting that this is a, a, an acceptable answer to your question, I think documenting the cases accurately, factually, in accordance with uh, India's human rights obli uh, obligations, I think is a, uh, a, a nonetheless a step forward. Thanks, Stuart. I just want to remind all the participants that we will have a, a better opportunity to discuss some of the issues, including issues related to the Armed Forces Special Powers Act during the seminar, in which we'll focus more on issues related to Kashmir and not just uh, law, international law on, on, on right to life. Uh, with that, uh, can I invite Nusrat to unmute herself and ask her a question? Thank you so much, Samir. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Maslin, for the presentation. Um, I think um, I'm going to ask a very general and broad question, which is, um, how is Kashmir issue viewed uh, in international human rights law? Uh, I'm asking this because uh, when it comes to India, they say uh, it's an internal matter. Uh, it's an internal territory, uh, but when uh, when viewed internationally, uh, especially from uh, from the from the many UN resolutions, uh, it, they state it's a disputed territory. So uh, I, I I heard some of the discussions before, and uh, some of the key themes are like you know why is this issue not being uh, raised internationally, uh, and Having taken uh, uh, an international human rights law course before, I understand that because this issue uh, needs to have uh, like exhausted domestic remedies, and then it'll kind of you know uh, be raised uh, um, at least like in in the I'm not exactly sure like it, by the international organizations or or courts, uh, but just to understand where does it exactly lie and will it ever be like discussed in international courts um, if it's not a domestic matter or how, I think um, the question is like not really clear in my head also. So if you could just uh, um, put some light on that. Uh, th that's fine, uh, Nusrat. So, um... If you, uh, as a state, if you say that an issue is an internal matter, you are accepting that you have jurisdiction for the purposes of human rights. Um, the fact that it is disputed as well is not going to affect that. If you are claiming certain territory, or even if you are occupying certain uh, territory, then uh, you, uh, therefore, de jure, by, by manner of law, you have human rights obligations, including uh, first and foremost, of course, the right to life over individuals within that jurisdiction. So um, I don't think the jurisdictional issue is the biggest problem. I think it's the, um, the challenge in finding a forum where this can be uh, discussed. Um, the, the Human Rights Council is there, it does discuss uh, issues uh, uh, such as this, but it would require a very concerted effort uh, to get states uh, to bring this up uh, before the uh, council. Um, so again, I'm not sure I've got a perfect uh, issue in terms of the practical implementation, but I don't think the jurisdictional issue is the challenge. Thanks, Stuart. Can I, can I ask uh, Manishit Uzma to unmute and ask a question? Um, greetings to everyone and thank you so much for this constructive discussion. My uh, question is relating to a question that was formally asked in today's discussion. Uh, 
um, it was about documentation. And someone said that we have organizations like APDP and um, JKCCS who keep on documenting whatever is happening here. But recently, um, some months ago, we have seen that um, the Indian uh, forces have, uh, Indian organizations basically, which is popularly known as NIA, has raided the offices and has uh, taken up the documents, the records, etc., that were available in the offices. So um, does it in, like does it count when we say that they are preventing the information because these are reputed organizations and are quite registered with the United Nations as well. They have uh, been reporting cases at the High Commission of Human Rights. But now since um, such raids are being conducted, can we say that uh, indirectly or overlapping with other rights, uh, it's also preventing the information from moving out and it's violative of right to life. Because if you're not allowing, you're kind of committing aggression on common civilians, and then you're not allowing the information to be public, in public domain. Similarly, we had a state human right commission that we are aware that after revocation of Article 370 is no longer there. So these two questions, like what is the method of enforceability? If uh, international organizations are not allowed to work, uh, how is the how are the offenses that are being committed going to be put in the public domain in the like larger perspective that's my question and does it somehow relate to um indirectly relate to violation of right to life um thanks Amarshi. i think the second uh, of your questions is a harder sell um i i understand the logic and i understand the causation um i'm not sure how easy it would be to sustain that as an argument as being a violation of the right to life. What you can say, however, is uh, that there are very clear obligations to uh, respect and protect human rights defenders. And uh, the UN has a special rapporteur on uh, the protection of human rights defenders. And these kind of uh, uh, instances that you're describing, the raiding of offices, the intimidation of human rights defenders are exactly uh, what uh, the special rapporteur's job is to publicize, report on and seek to address. So uh, I don't know if the rapporteur has visited India in recent years, but that's something that can be done by contacting the rapporteur and saying, have you thought about uh, a visit to India? We have seen the other special rapporteurs, a number of special rapporteurs have been accepted to visit India in the last few years. And I think that would be something uh, concrete uh, that could be uh, addressed. Professor, I have a small follow-up question for that. Um, if the rapporteurs are allowed and this matter is publicized, uh, say for example, the reports that come from the High Commission, uh, is there something like a sanction that we can put on a country not to, um, not to kind of, you know, um, make such circumstances that human rights defenders cannot work freely. Is there something that we can do about this thing, I mean, apart I, from publicizing it in the report? But but I think that is the uh, the primary. I, I don't think uh, sanctions as such uh, are likely uh, in this case. What is uh, nonetheless or can be effective is uh, uh, embarrassment and potentially a resolution. Now, whether you consider that a sanction uh, or, or not, but you have to build the case uh, for that. And uh, the first step is, is to get the special rapporteur interested, visiting. Um, uh, in the case of every visit, there will be a follow-up report. They do write a report and that report will set out both uh, general concerns and also specific uh, issues uh, that arise. So I think that's uh, a, a positive uh, step forward uh, that could be taken. I don't pretend that that will resolve all the issues uh, because it won't, but nonetheless, I think it will be a step in the right direction. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, I just want to remind all the participants that we have two former special rapporteurs, one on right to, to one on uh, freedom of expression and the other on right to life, if I'm not wrong, uh, Professor Gestroff Haynes, who are also going to lecture us in the subsequent mm -hmm. weeks. So it would be very nice to, to have these discussions about how enforceability and documentation takes place uh, then. There is a question in the chat from Maliha Zainab. She asks, can you pl please elaborate on the enforceability of international law in conflicts, 
especially with respect to violation of right to life, given the fact that states are able to get away with it, despite being party to international law instruments and signatory to various conventions. Um, thank you. Uh, one of the, the great challenges and one I would say of the great drawbacks of international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, is that it doesn't have implementing mechanisms in the way that human rights law does. But that disadvantage for IHL is an advantage that human rights law brings to the table. Given that, as we saw, uh, the right to life does uh, apply to the use of force in a situation of armed conflict, you have the opportunity for the treaty bodies, for example, if it were established a commission of inquiry, to look at situations where the right to life was violated, whether that be a summary execution, whether that be disproportionate use of force, uh, whether that be a violation of the principle of distinction. The challenge, of course, is getting that uh, commission authorised. But we've seen uh, a dozen uh, countries over the last 20 years concerned uh, by these uh, commissions. So uh, again, I say the important stuff document what's going on, um, encourage a special rapporteurs and treaty bodies uh, to take up the issue. And if it becomes uh, loud enough in the uh, media and among states, then maybe there's just a chance that such a commission could be instituted. Uh, you mentioned, Samir, uh, that uh, Professor Haynes will come before you. It would be very interesting uh, for him to tell you what his follow-up uh, discussions with the authorities were after his mission in 2012. Thank you. Can I ask Abin Mushtaq to unmute and ask the question? Hello, everyone. Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, I, I want to ask you a question which is very recent, uh, like uh, there have been a development in Kashmir where the state authorities are denying the dead bodies of rebels to their families. Although the same matter, it has been uh, declared a basic human right in different provisions of different uh, international conventions, how do you look at it and how and when exactly the same rights can be enforced? Thank you. Sorry, Abhi, could I just clarify? You're saying that they're not allowed to bury the bodies or they're not allowed to see the bodies? They are not. They are denying to give the bo dead bodies of rebels to their families for their yeah. last rights. Um, thank you. Th this is a, um, a slightly uh, difficult uh, area of international law in the sense that um, the standards uh, globally, I don't think, are totally clear. Even within the European Court of Human Rights, which has addressed these issues in the context of the conflict and counterterrorism operations in Chechnya, for example, or in, in Turkey, um, the jurisprudence is not absolutely clear. What, uh, what does come through is that there must be some kind of an opportunity for the families uh, to say goodbye, but that does not necessarily extend to a right to burial. And I know that can, uh, that can be extremely hurtful uh, uh, to the families, um, but uh, the, the situation in international law is not clear cut and it's not necessarily the one that we might like to see from the perspective of the families. And I'm sorry, I can't give you a a better answer than that at the moment. But I don't think you can say today that a refusal to give uh, the body uh, to a family is unequivocally a violation of human rights law. If we're, the, the right that's concerned is not, is not the right to life, it's the right to freedom from torture or other cruel or inhuman or degrading treatment or, 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 or punishment. It's just uh, a, an ongoing discussion without necessarily being resolved. Thanks, Stuart. I'm quite conscious of the time. Are you happy to take some more questions because there are plenty of raised hands and questions in the chat? If not, we can we can pause them for the seminar later this week. Um, that's fine. There was just one that I meant to come back on. Um, uh, Shuchi, quite a while ago, had asked about um, the Minnesota report and op autopsy. And I think that's quite an important issue in the context of, uh, of India, at least what I saw 
uh, from afar. What, what the uh, Minnesota guidelines uh, say is that generally an autopsy should be conducted, but they understand that there are certain circumstances where an autopsy is not uh, um, feasible. So, for example, one of our forensic pathologists was from Kenya, and they said if they receive a body that is riddled with bullets, big problem with gun crime in uh, Nairobi uh, in particular, um, then they would not necessarily do an autopsy. Um, so what the uh, protocol, uh, what the guidelines say are uh, a, an autopsy should be uh, conducted. If it is not conducted, then that the reason for it not being conducted must be justified in writing and must be subject to appeal to a court. So in general, an autopsy should be conducted, but there are, as I say, exceptional circumstances. Thanks, Stuart. There's one question. Uh, this is more of an international humanitarian law question, but uh, Vaseem Mushtaq asks, do overground workers working for armed groups in a conflict zone constitute as civilians directly participating in hostilities and do they lo lose immunity? Um, sorry, uh, Samir, could you repeat? Do all which, yeah. which kind of workers? Do over overground workers. So this is not a technical term, but this is a term used in Kashmir. Uh, civilians who provide some sort of support either informational or otherwise to armed groups, hmm. they're termed as overground workers. And the question okay. is, do they constitute as civilians taking direct part in hostilities and therefore losing their immunity? Okay, um, I I'll give you something of an answer whilst um, recognizing that this continues to be a very disputed uh, area of international law. So in 2009, the International Committee of the Red Cross um, issued interpretive guidance on the meaning of uh, direct participation in hostilities. Those three words took up 85 pages of a report indicating the complexity. What they said was, uh, and I think this is relatively un uncontroversial, is that there are um, three elements to DPH, direct participation in hostilities. Um, uh, there is threshold of harm. You must be harming uh, the enemy. There must be direct causation your actions must lead directly to the possibility of harm, and there must be what they call belligerent nexus. That is, your uh, acts are helping one party to the armed conflict against another. Now, uh, the issue of transmission of information um, is obviously uh, um, uh, one possible uh, way of harming the enemy. And what the guidance suggests is that if the information is tactical, I is related to specific operations, then that is the uh, direct participation. But if it is more general or generic information, then it is indirect uh, participation and that does not lose civilian immunity. What I would say though is this continues to be a contested area of international law. And you have states like the US that talks of anyone associated with an armed group effectively losing their civilian immunity. I don't think that's where international law is, but it is nonetheless a contested issue. Thanks, Stuart. We are past the time. Should we, should we end it here or are you happy to take more questions? Um, maybe I'll take a couple more and, and then I will have to uh, prepare for my next uh, session. Yes, maybe a yes. couple more. No, no, completely understand and really appreciate you engaging with all these questions. There is a question by Saira. The question is, in the context of disproportionality in the use of force during armed conflict, in order to avoid expected excessive civilian harm, why does it almost feel like the duty to protect life can be used as an excuse to ignore protection against arbitrary deprivation of life, specifically when the army uses excessive force against a peaceful protest, for example? Mm -hmm. Um, so th there's a couple of elements uh, there. There's the notion of proportionality itself, and then there's the issue of the assembly. Um, let me deal with the assembly one uh, first. Uh, so uh, I've mentioned uh, on a number of occasions the general comment on the right to life. Um, more recently, in July of last year, the Human Rights Committee adopted General Comment 37 on the right of peaceful assembly. And um, there is a particular uh, provision uh, this was drafted by Professor Haynes, so again, it might be good to, uh, to raise that uh, with him. Uh, but there is a particular provision 
on the right of peaceful assembly in a situation of armed conflict. This was the toughest of all the paragraphs in the general comment to draft. But I think uh, that what is in there is, uh, is helpful. Um, uh, so I would suggest uh, having a look at that particular provision, because first and foremost, it says the covenant still applies and the right still applies in armed conflict. And when it is a peaceful uh, assembly, it is protected as such. If, on the other hand, uh, you have a situation where it is not a peaceful assembly and, in fact, it is being um, uh, uh, taken over by uh, armed uh, actors, then it may be that IHL on the conduct of hostilities apply. And again, the paragraph says, nonetheless, you need to ensure that distinction and proportionality are respected. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, that proportionality is a permissive uh, regime. It is intended to be the opposite. It is intended to be a protective regime. Um, the challenge, of course, is in this wonderful world, excessive. Uh, what do we mean by that? And, and as with the, the previous question on distinction, we do have an issue. We do have a problem in ensuring um, some consistency of protection across different armed forces. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Muin has a very, very short question, and then I will we'll end the question and answer with Ashwarya asking her final question. Muin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, absolutely, yeah, thank you. I just posted the question as well. Um, do enforced disappearances not fall under ICCPR Article 6, Right to Life? I've almost never seen enforced disappearances discussed in that context, or do they fall exclusively and separately mm. under the convention uh, for the prevention of enforced disappearances, which in the context of Kashmir, neither India or Pakistan have uh, ratified? Uh, thank you very much, Maureen. That's an excellent question. It's one that I should have addressed in the presentation. Um, uh, yes, it does. Absolutely, it falls uh, within both Article 6 on the right to life and Article 7, on uh, the uh, prohibition of torture and other forms of cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment. And the general comment on the right to the life spends quite considerable time on the issue of enforced disappearances, explaining when uh, and to what extent an enforced disappearance will, co will be covered by uh, either or both of these uh, rights. But absolutely, it falls full square <laughs> within the protection of the right to life and the prohibition of torture. And I mentioned also the uh, Minnesota Protocol, which seeks to apply the right to life, uh, that is also uh, not just in relation to uh, deaths, uh, dead bodies, but also applies uh, to enforced disappearance. So uh, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at the provisions in both of those uh, documents, absolutely full square within the right to life. Thank you. I just Thanks. had a side question regarding the threshold for armed conflict. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you went into that, but what is the minimum threshold to define armed conflict, especially in the context of Kashmir, where it can be argued there is no international armed conflict if there is no second state actor, such as Pakistan, directly involved in conflict all the time, or if it doesn't enter uh, the actual territory of, of uh, the Kashmir Valley, where predominantly Indian forces are deployed, and that conflict is reserved uh, to the ceasefire line between India and Pakistan. However, noting that there are also non-state actors in Kashmir that Indian armed forces are, are up against, uh, but the, the, the violence or the, the, the encounters or the, the conflict itself can be sporadic. Uh, so what is the minimum threshold to, to declare uh, territory is in armed conflict or the actors are in armed conflict? Thank uh, thanks very much, Maureen. So um, I didn't go into this in, in the presentation, but there are two types of, inter uh, of armed conflict. Uh, you've mentioned international, and there the threshold is very low. Um, minimal uh, use of force between two armed forces or between potentially an armed force and a proxy armed group that is uh, uh, supported or operated by another state would meet that threshold. But more often, uh, and in most cases, you have what is called a non-international armed conflict between a state armed force and an organized, organized armed group. By organized, we mean one that has a sort of military structure capable of uh, conducting military style operations. Uh, 
Um, there, the threshold of violence is higher. Um, now, I am not an expert on Kashmir, but from what I see from afar, the level of violence that is ongoing clearly meets the definition for a non-international armed conflict. I realize there are also political concerns around how you depict the conflict, but I think uh, that the criteria uh, for a non-international armed conflict are nonetheless met. Thank you. Can we have the last question from Ashwarya? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hi, Professor. I hi. just wanted to ask a follow-up question uh, related to the principle of distinction. Mm -hmm. I uh, have no background in international law, but I'm an IR graduate. So I just want a clarification. Um, if civilians directly participate in hostility while defending themselves, do they still lose their immunity? Who interprets whether it is an act of defense or one of intentional hostility? Are there exceptions to the rule, protection, if any? This is my question, maybe a bit broad. No, no, that's a very good question, uh, uh, Ashwarya. Thank you. Um, so yes, if you are purely engaging in personal self-defense or defense of your family, uh, for example, that is not direct participation in hostilities because you are not seeking to favor one uh, party to the armed conflict over the other. The challenge, of course, is that the person in front of you may not know that. Now, uh, if you've got a case, for example, uh, that the person in front of you is uh, uh, trying to uh, engage in torture or rape or, or whatever it may be, then that person cannot say they did not know what was going on in the middle of a battle it's more complicated factually. But the situation as a matter of law is if you are purely engaging in individual self-defense or self-defense of, uh, for example, your family members, that is not direct participation in hostilities and you do not lose your civilian immunity. Thanks a lot. With that, we conclude today's Thank lecture. So Thanks much. a lot, Stuart, for, for uh, engaging uh, with all the questions in a very, very lively manner. And thanks a lot to all the participants for joining and for asking such nice questions. I understand that a lot of questions were a mix of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. While the focus of this course is only on international human rights law, we'll try to do something on international humanitarian law and uh, how it applies to Kashmir, uh, maybe after this course, course is over. Uh, we will have more opportunity to discuss some of these things, including, uh, you know, issues very, very specific to Kashmir in the in the seminar, which is scheduled on Saturday, 20th of Feb at 12.30 GMT or 6 p.m. IST. Uh, I will see all of you then. Bye-bye.